But when I look around and I think things over. All of my good days, they outweighed my bad days, so I won't complain. So I can hardly see the road. Then I'd ask the question, Lord, why, why so much pain? But God knows what's best for me. Sometimes my weary eyes, they just can't see. So I stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I won't complain. And you know why? God been good to me. This whole world could ever be. God been so good to me. He dried tears away. Right now he's turning darkness into day. So I gotta get out to the minister's way. So I'll stop and say, thank you, Lord, for all that I've been through. Thank you, Lord, for food on my table. Thank you, Lord. 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 I won't. I won't. Oh. Mr. Louis Parakhan. I said, Minister Louis Parakhan. Beneficent, the merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his mercy and his goodness to the members of the human family. That whenever any member of that family strays from his path and loses his favor before he punishes, he always raises from among that strayed member of the family mm -hmm. a prophet or a messenger yes. to whom he gives what is called divine revelation and yes. by means of that revelation he guides that member back to his straight yes. path yes. 
back to his favor and sometimes even gives that erring member the ruling scepter that after they were lost and become found and after they were blind and now see and after they were dead and now raised to life they now can represent God to the rest of humanity. That's why we thank Almighty God, Allah, for Moses and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank him for Jesus and the Gospel. We thank him for Muhammad and the Quran. I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and I could never thank Allah enough for his coming and raising one up from among us the lost sheep the prodigal son the children of Israel in a modern house of bondage to free us from our tormentors and to lift us from the bottom to the top. And though we are the last to make us the first and though we are the tail to make us the head. And this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our sight. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu alaikum. But in English it means peace be unto you. To my beloved brother and pastor, Pastor T.O. Barrett, his lovely wife, saints, members of the Nation of Islam, and all those who may be looking for a church or mosque home, I'm very, very, very honored to be here with you this morning. It was 20 years ago in the month of March that I spoke in this house during that month. And my subject was true Christian love. And that subject that I took that night has been spread all over the world from this blessed house, this blessed pastor, and this blessed people who have weathered many storms and have more yet to weather. I, I'm happy to be here and I always like to come early so that I can feel the Spirit yes. Amen. and then from the Spirit take my text. Yes. Hallelujah. But I was late because I was preaching. Well, all right. And I didn't get a chance to hear all or see all that went before me, but I heard my pastor. Yes. I heard his son. Yes. And I heard my brother, I shall not complain. You know, all of us, to be where we are, have come up the rough side of the mountain. And I want to talk to you today, but it's a very sobering kind of message. 
because we're living in a time of trouble like there never was since there was a time and a nation. We're living at a time when Jesus said if those days were not shortened for his elect's sake, no flesh would be saved. We have entered that period. When you see the tsunami in Asia killing over 200,000 people, earthquake in Pakistan, when in America you see storms raging, fire on one side, water on the other, snow, cold, ice. And we see the President of the United States unraveling in front of our eyes. A man that used the tragedy of 9-11 to launch a war that is not justified by truth mm-hmm. or justice. Yeah. And our young sons and daughters who love this country and are willing to fight to defend and protect it are dying on a foreign battlefield on the basis of a lie. The war is going to widen. It won't get easier. Because the dreaded war that the scripture speaks about, we have now entered. The scripture says when you see Jerusalem Mm -hmm. surrounded by armies, see, come down off the rooftop and, and start fleeing and pray that your flight will not be in winter. Hard days are coming to America because she said, I sit as a queen and shall see no sorrow and has made other nations and their cities desolate and burned them to the ground destroy their governments as long as their governments do not rule according to America's international designs on their raw materials. Every leader in Africa that rose to fight for the true liberation of Africans, this government Mm -hmm. either assassinated them or through their money they planned coups and drove those leaders out of those countries so that the multinational corporations of America could suck the blood, the life blood of those nations. So that in Africa today, millions of people are trying to live on a dollar a day or less while we can tithe and we can eat while other nations are suffering famine. Yes, sir. Well, Jesus spoke to this. Yes, he said there will be famine, there will be pestilence, there will be earthquakes in diverse places, but this is just the beginning of sorrows. I wish I could tell you today that there's good times. 
there are no more good times for the United States of America. Now you may say that I shouldn't say these things, but if I don't warn you, then your blood will be required of me. So you will never be able to say that I didn't tell you what you needed to know to come up out of your lethargy and your foolishness. The time is out for hypocritical approaching Jesus with our lips while our hearts are far removed from him. The church now in mosques becomes a playground where we give lip service to righteousness while we practice evil because Satan, listen to me, Satan is making evil fair seeming to us. Everything that God in this scripture says, thou shalt not do. America is guiding you to do what God has forbid us to do and we do it and then come to church thinking or come to the mosque thinking it's all right as long as I give some money singing the choir. Hell no, it's not all right. Well, I always should say no to hell. And you should say no to hell and yes to heaven but heaven and hell have prerequisite behaviors. Watch yourself, man. America is the modern Babylon. She's a modern Sodom and Gomorrah. She's a modern Egypt. She is a modern Rome. Rome was so busy with her licentious feats and her games and her gladiators and her warriors fighting to live so that Caesar would say this rather than this. And today, in the new Rome, the modern Rome, we praise our gladiators. We praise our football players, our, our basketball players, our, our singers and our dancers. But we don't praise righteousness. Righteousness is scorn. And when you say you want to do what is right, your friends say what's wrong with you. And it makes it very difficult, Pastor, for us to preach righteousness on Sunday, have a Bible class on Tuesday or Wednesday, and have other spiritual meetings, and then we send our people home to turn on the TV where filth and degeneracy is on the TV from morning till night. You turn on your radio and we love good singing, we love good music, we love good rap. But what are we rapping about? What are we singing about? A man singing his way into a woman's clothes? A woman taking off her clothes to excite a man with the beauty of her body? Is this God's world? I hate this world. And I am with God to destroy this world. I want 
want you to hear me today. This world is destroying our children. This world is turning our boys into girls and our girls into boys. This world is feeding us drugs and guns. A little beautiful 14 year old girl. Here are some shots and goes to the window. And today her parents are sad. Her friends are sad, her schoolmates are sad because they have to attend a funeral of a 14 year old child. And this is going on not only in Chicago but all over America. Do you think that you're gonna have to pay for this? I was down in New Orleans, they call it the Big Easy. And there was a meeting and there were pastors present and, and leaders and whatnot and uh, I was asked to speak and I had been up on the levee and I had been in the ninth ward and I saw devastation like I had never seen before. I sent a team from the final call down to make a video or uh, uh, a documentary of the destruction because you can't know what happened down there by being here or by watching the little things that they put on television. If you set your foot on the ground, then you will see. So I asked the question of my pastor friends and the leaders. I said, we believe in Christianity and in Islam and in Judaism. That everything that happens happens either by the active will of God or the permissive will of God. God is the ultimate cause of all causes. But most of us don't have the courage to question God. What kind of stupid student will not dare to ask a question of the teacher that the teacher may awaken the student and broaden the student's knowledge? So I raise the question that many pastors are afraid to raise. Since everything that happens is either by the active or permissive will of God, why did God actively bring a hurricane of that magnitude and why did he permit man-made destruction of the levee? So you have God made and man made, but God let it happen. And we saw our people wading in water up to their waist, bodies floating by. A mother reached out gave her baby to her husband because she couldn't hold on any longer. Said, save the child. And the mother drowned. Children with rafts going in and out trying to save people, breaking into stores to get food to give to people. Many died. And it, just a few days ago, they said, well, we're bringing some dogs in now because there still may be some remains six months later in the houses. Katrina laid bare the hypocrisy of America's so-called love for the poor. Katrina has laid bare the hypocrisy of racism that's institutionalized. 
the government knew fully well in advance that that hurricane was building up in the Gulf and yet the president did nothing. I spoke to the ambassador from Cuba. The Cuban ambassador told me, Brother Farrakhan, we have had a few Category 5 hurricanes. We have lost houses, but we have never lost one life. And we called the State Department offering what we know because we are prepared for disaster. And we called them three times. And the government of the United States, with her arrogance, turned them down. The Bible teaches a haughty spirit and pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. Look at our president, how he walks. <laughs> Reveling in the might of his army, his navy. But God can bring a snowstorm and the plane can't get up. And the tank can't move. He can put a freeze on where you can't fire nothing. God is God, not the president, not the government, not the powers of white America. I said, is black on black crime going on down here? Is rebellion against the word, the will, and the law of God going on down here? Yes. 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 Do you love to party and act a fool down here? Yes. 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 Then didn't you think that God would do as he did in the past? While you're dancing and giving in, uh, in marriage and having a good time? That's when the flood came in the days of Noah because the people did not want to hear the preaching of righteousness. They heaped to themselves teachers that tickle their ears. When a man wants to get to a woman, he gets close to her ear and starts blowing in it. <laughs> biting on it. She might not want to yield, but after such carrying on, she ain't going to say, Lord, save me from this. So I told them God brought a punishment to America, but he also brought it to you. And the punishment is going to spread. There will be many more disasters that we are not prepared for. I'm taking a team to Cuba, God willing, in the next few weeks to learn about disaster preparedness. So that from every pulpit, we have to warn our people so that when disaster strikes, now wait, now you live in Chicago. You think, well, oh, no, God. See, one hurricane yes. can do down there what an earthquake can do up here. Yes. And what do you mean earthquake in diverse places? Uh -huh. yes. See, you glory in these cities and your skyscrapers, but he's going to bring them down. You're going to know that he is God. Big bad America is going to know that there's a God present today and he's not playing with America. And he's after you. He got a job for you. Right. 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 Mm. 
My God, he calls me. He calls me by the thunder. I hear him call with the end of my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. You ain't got long to be the clown for white folks. You ain't got long to be on Fox playing the fool while your people are dying in the streets of America. You ain't got long to pimp. You ain't got long to hustle. You're going to pay a price for rebelling against God and his Christ. So I told them, be careful. The white folk down there don't want the blacks that are scattered in 44 states to come back to New Orleans. They've already looked at how they can take the Ninth Ward and bulldoze it. Now the bulldozers are coming. They're stealing the property of black folk. The black folk are out scattered. An election is due April the 22nd. But this wicked government can let Iraqis here vote for somebody over there and have not made a way for the citizens of New Orleans to vote because it was once a chocolate city. But now they want to, as they say, shrink the footprint of New Orleans. And our black brother, Secretary of HUD, said uh, 30% of the blacks that once were here won't be here anymore. And so you won't have a black mayor again a black police chief, a black fire chief, a black controlled city council, because they want it all back. And so I told them, remember rich people? Remember, Jesus said, See, I just love the way Jesus speaks. <laughs> And I really want to see black preachers preach like Jesus preached. Oh, get out of it. Because judgment is going to begin in the house of God. You don't want to condemn what Jesus condemned. You don't want to correct people when they're going wrong. You don't want to hurt people's feelings because it may hurt the collection plate. But if you hurt God's feelings by not warning the people of their errant behavior, then they will die in their sin, but God will require it at our hands. Ezekiel. I think it's two and nine. I, I could be wrong, but Ezekiel told him, see, if you see the man in his sin, he will die in his sin. But if you warn him, you've delivered your own soul. But if you warn him not, and he dies in his sin, I'm going to require it of the preacher. Religion is no plaything. 
Jesus Christ is no plaything. Don't think that when he comes back, he's coming back to play with us. I wonder how many of you believe in his return. And I wonder how many of us will be ready when he returns. Because the book say he's coming back, but in his hand is a sword. And it's dripping with blood. He ain't coming back to teach. He's coming back to kill the enemies of his teaching and set up a government. Uh, you all talk this democracy mess. Trying to vote for. As though voting is going to change the reality of the wickedness of American life. Talk back to me. Vote for Christ. Vote for the establishment of his kingdom on earth. Because in his kingdom, there'll be peace and joy and Freedom and justice and equality. Vote out Bush. Vote out Blair. I want to see the kingdom of God established on earth. Usually every Sunday when the church meets, I believe you all say our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Watch it now, watch it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Do you really want his kingdom? What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is a government and the people that live under the rules and laws of God. That's his kingdom. If I truly love you, I can't steal. If I truly love you, I can't lie on you. If I truly love you, I can't covet what is yours. If I truly love you, I can't go after your wife or your husband. If I truly love you, I can't break into your house and destroy your children. If I truly love you, I can't kill. What I love. What have the Iraqis done to you? Come on now. That's right. You mean nothing? What have the Afghan people done to you? Well, what are you doing over there? There's some people that's doing a hell of a lot to us over here. Why don't we stand up against injustice where we are? So I thought when I came to church today, I would bring my Bible and close with the sound bite. You know, Pastor Barrett, you can't really be a disciple of Christ and be loved by the world. Wait, wait. Most of us want to be loved by the world. I want to be loved by the government. By the mayor. By the president. I want to be loved by God and his Christ.
Listen, 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 listen. I watched for four hours, five hours, six hours, the funeral of Coretta Scott King. <laughs> yeah, listen to this. <laughs> it was a fantastic home going for a woman who has earned the right to our respect and honor. Four presidents were there, including the sitting president. <clears throat> I was out in Arizona and I, I was watching. I said, oh, wh where's my brother, Harry Belafonte? Where, where, where is he? I said, oh, probably because Bush is gonna be there he didn't want to speak because he might say something that he thought would be inappropriate. That was my thinking. A few days later, I was on the phone with Mr. Belafonte. He was in great pain. Because Harry Belafonte was one of the top fundraisers for Martin Luther King in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And when Dr. King was assassinated, it was Harry Belafonte, they tell me, that raised the money to pay off his house and sent money every month to the children. So much so that the children refer to him as Uncle Harry. But when four white presidents <laughs> were coming to honor their mother, they disinvited Harry Belafonte. And according to his words to me, he said, <clears throat> they said, well, you can come and we'll make a place for you in the auditorium. But it was a mistake to invite you to speak. My God. The children didn't say it to their uncle. They had someone else to call him and say it. So he decided not to come. Now, 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 now. See, but there's a sickness in it. See, you love white people more than you love your black set. And you're going to go to hell with that kind of stupid love. Listen to me. Yeah, I'm going to hell. There's nothing wrong with you loving white people. But there's a heck of a lot wrong with it when you will choose a president that never did nothing for you and disrespect a man who was your benefactor. And that's what bothers me about the civil rights movement. Because you all take all kind of abuse from white people. And you forgive. But you're angry with your Christian sister or brother in Life Center if they say or do something to offend you. You don't open your mouth to say, I forgive. But you can forgive a man that lynched you, burned you, raped you, robbed you, spoiled you. You have a diseased heart. 
a diseased mind. Afraid to love yourself. And afraid to hate your enemies. Well, well just a minute, minister, because <laughs> hate hurts the hater. Where did you get that from? <laughs> the same lyncher that feels that if you hate him, you may return the favor? <laughs> So he don't want justified hate over your stupid love? We love everybody. You a liar. When you say you love everybody, you don't love nobody. Not even yourself. Because it's difficult to love somebody that's doing evil to you continuously. Although you can, but it's difficult. Wait a minute now. Now, God is what I said last week at Savior's Day. God said he loved Jacob. I didn't, I didn't write this now. But he hated Esau. Wait a minute, God. Come on now. You mean you hate? Yes, I hate. David hated. Jesus hated. Ooh, minister, now just a minute. Now you're going too far. I haven't gone far enough. <laughs> I'm going to prove what I say. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm going with you. And you can go home and get your Bible and study. <laughs> you need to love what God loves. And you need to hate what God hates. And you'll be right with God. But if you love what God hates, then you'll do the thing that God hates. You didn't hear me. <laughs> now, after my speech on Sunday, my poor sister, Claudette Marie Johnson Muhammad, got a lot of names. <laughs> Whose record is impeccable. Yes, Anybody that know Claudette, she's a good woman, and she has interfaced with white and black and Jews and Christians and nationalists and everybody. And she gets a good report. She spends months in Israel for health purposes with our Hebrew Israelite brothers that are sisters that are there. How could she be an anti-Semite? <laughs> well, she's not, but you are. <laughs> See, I don't want no Negroes trying to defend me. <laughs> if you don't know how to defend me. For that man, the governor. See, he's a good man. In parent, in. Yeah. Well, he's a good man. But see, politics is so full of manure. The poor man wanted her to resign. Like she did something wrong for being on the commission to end hate and discrimination. So when she said, no, I'm not going to resign. I haven't done nothing wrong. 
You want me off the commission, you find me. Well, your letters, other people's letters fired off. Politically, he said, oh, God. If I get rid of her, I'll anger the black community. I know that's right. Then the ADL whispers in his ear. They heard my speech last Sunday where I talked about the synagogue of Satan. It's in the Bible. Go read it. Those who say they are Jews and are not, they're blasphemy. It's blasphemous to say you the chosen of God and then do the work of Satan. See, and you may not like this part of my talk. Bring it up. Bring it up. I'm not trying to hurt nobody. That's all right. Speak the truth. Then the governor said, but I didn't know who she was. I didn't know who she was connected to. That's a big lie. <laughs> then say, I detest the minister's speech. It was divisive. It was hate-filled. She called and asked him, asked his people, did he hear what the minister said? That's right, that's right, that's right, he did. Did you hear it in context? No, no, that's no he didn't hear it. <laughs> well then, why are you saying that you detest what you didn't even hear? Uh, let me just be, come straight down. The Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith has had a field day. They feel an inordinate sense of power because they make people bow to them when you don't say or do what pleases them. Senator Percy was a good senator from this state, but he disagreed with the kind of money that was being sent to Israel every year, numbering about $4 billion. And he spoke it, and they got rid of him. <laughs> Gus Savage was our congressperson. Amen. Amen. They worked till they got rid of him because he stood up and defended me. Yes, sir. Cynthia McKinney. Yes, sir. Our brother in Alabama, yes, sir. Uh, Hilliard, they got rid of him. Anybody that stands up to them, they find a way to knock you down and make an example so the rest of you, you tread lightly when you're talking about false Jews. <laughs> Minister, please. See, but if I don't speak truth, yes, unafraid, yes, then where will you get the strength yes, to stand up? Must everybody bow down to Baal? See, the Hebrew boys were put in a fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down. But there was somebody in the furnace, like the Son of Man, keeping the fire cool. See, when you stand up for God and speak His word unafraid, angels come by you. And God then is pleased with you, but the world won't like you. After my speech, the next day there was nothing in the paper. <laughs> Though there were 20,000 people at the United Center 
that paid twenty, thirty, a hundred dollars to get in. Why are you charging people to come in fair again? <laughs> we couldn't even sign a contract with them unless I wrote a check to them for $75,000 and that was just the beginning. So when it costs us nearly 200,000 or more dollars to put it on, and we're putting it on not to make money, but to get a message to you still. We cannot afford to lose a quarter of a million dollars. So if you pay 10 and you pay 20 and somebody pays 30 and somebody pay 100, then we can get it back to do some more good. Wait now, wait now. The next day in the Sun Times, they had a picture of me. Hollywood Jews, he blasts Hollywood Jews, homosexuals, and whatnot. Already seed in the public now. See, that man is terrible. Then they came on Channel 7. He said, it's all right to hate. What kind of man is this? They don't tell you what I really said. Because you would be convinced. So I tell you the truth. I want to call them out. If what I'm saying is false, I don't want your Negro lackeys. I want you. Since you like reality TV, why not meet Firecon in the public and prove him to be a liar? Then we all can turn him down. I'm ready to go to war with them for the sake of truth. Now, my pastor said there's a problem with the roof. He was diligent in watching this house go up. A beautiful house yes. That's right. yes. but they wouldn't let him go up top because it was dangerous so he didn't actually see but why should he That's right. have to go up top if you hire in a contractor and an engineer to go up and see for you but evidently we hate each other so we take the money and don't do the job. So many years later, the roof is weakening. So my brother had to borrow $1.9 million so he could fix the roof that they neglected to fix properly when he paid them the first millions with your help to do it. He can't pay a note like that without help. And he can't afford to wait 20 years to pay it off because we don't know tomorrow. But we know tomorrow is getting dark. So this has to be paid. And all those of us who have benefited from his ministry need to sacrifice something to help pay 
when the contracting is done, mm -hmm. yes. that our roof is on and on right. Yes. Yes. And Life Center Church will not cave in at the top. No. Yes. But I think, in a sense, it's a sign. Mm -hmm. Black people are caving in at the top. You've got a good foundation, the people. But the leadership is rotten to the core. Sell our people out for nothing. Many of us are unfit to stand in front of our people. <coughs> <coughs> because if you're not willing to lay down your life for the sheep <laughs> what are you doing standing up in front of me? some of us are hirelings we're in it for the ride we're in it for the money we're in it to live a good life yes. at the expense of the mass hurt right. yes. of our people. Yes. Right. We scheme. Yes. My Lord. And we're haters uh -huh. of others in leadership. Yes. Because we want to be the center of attraction. Yes. We undermine movement. Yes, when movement is necessary. We undermine unity when unity is necessary. That's why I took for my subject the birth of a nation. Because in birth, the foot is usually at the mouth of the uterus until there's a turning. Because the foot can't lead the way to freedom. For the baby. They call it stillbirth. Or, or they call it breech birth. But when the, when the baby turns. See the real head then shows up. And the real head. Is in a lot of pain. Because it's got to push. Against the bone. Of the tiny house that held it. Yes, yes, yes. And it has to push. And mama. Gotta push. And so when the baby comes to birth. His head sometimes is bruised. His shoulders are bruised. It can't tell you what kind of pain it went through to get here. But you can tell the baby what kind of pain it took to bring it here. What I'm saying is, this house can't hold us no longer. God wants to give you land and make a great nation out of you. But he's got to separate you from your tormentors whom you seem to not want to let go of. Pharaoh has already let go of you. But you seem to have a problem letting him go. So what do they say about Farrakhan? Well, he's a hater. He's a divisive person in our community. He's a bigot. He's homophobic. He's anti-Semitic, a proponent of violence. He's anti-American. He's anti-Christian. Keep going, keep going. Man. Now, is that what I am really? Now, listen. Look. you wanted to make Jesus look bad all of you in this room know Jesus was 
not only a good man, but a perfect man. That's the word of God. How many here believe that Jesus was a perfect man? No, that's right. Hallelujah. But you could make Jesus look bad with a 30 second sound bite. I'm going to put Jesus on television in America. And his enemies in control of the TV. Now watch. Uh, Jesus is a very hateful man. Now, in the book of Luke, <laughs> Jesus said in the 14th chapter, the 26th verse, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. <laughs> then he said, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. I didn't write it. There it is. I'm going to call Jesus again. The hate teacher. The hate teacher. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He loved one and what? Imagine Jesus taking a subject like that at Life Center and the media was here. Tonight on the news, that man Jesus was at Life Center Church hosted by Pastor T.L. Barrett. Here's another hater. And Jesus took a subject, no man can serve two masters. He got to hate his mother, his father, his sisters, and his brothers. Surely this is a hate teacher. And the people in the audience who don't know context. Boy, that Jesus is bad, dude. Well, he's divisive. Oh, really? And in Matthew, I think it's the 14th, Chapter. <laughs> I get it. He says, Think not that I come to bring peace. Nay, a sword. That Jesus is a violent man that don't want peace with nobody. And listen how divisive that man is. He said, I come to set the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother and the father against the son. And they of a man own household will be his enemy. Sound bite. Jesus is divisive. He's violent. Carries weapons. And he's not a lover of peace. And what was he doing at Life Center Church? <laughs> Pastor Tia Barrett must have lost his mind to have somebody like that up there preaching. Now watch, here's another one. He's anti-Christian. Jesus was against the religious order of his day. And he told the religious hypocrites, you are like whited sepulchers, and in them are dead men's bones. See? Oh, when he started raking the, the rabbis over, 
And if you for God, you got to rake over false yeah. teachers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's against Rome. Whose face is on this coin? It is Caesar's. Well, render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? And unto God, what is God? He never wanted his disciples to join the Roman army. He said, be ye separate. You're in the world, but you're not of it. He's against Rome. Well, if he were in America and he took on Bush, this Jesus is a wild man, I'm telling you. I went to him speak today, and he's a real anti Semite, that Jesus. Let's go to John. Eighth chapter. Forty-fourth verse. Jesus is in an argument with the Jews of his day. What are they arguing with him for? He was a good man. But look at what Jesus said. I'm going to quote him now. <laughs> the anti-Semite, the hate teacher, the peace breaker, the violent man, the hater. I'm going to quote from the anti-Semite Jesus. <laughs> Some of the Jews were telling him that they were Abraham's children. And he said, well, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. When I speak that kind of truth, oh, they get their pens, they get their TV, they get their radio rake me over the coals and make you hate me without a cause. I have done nothing to black people. But my own people have rejected me because of what they say. Now you don't know what I'm saying. Oh, I will not buy one of his tapes. <laughs> But look here, then Jesus goes on. He said, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Since they didn't understand the miracle of his birth, they charged them with being born of fornication. Ah, look at the book now. Now look at what Jesus said back to them. He said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? See, I sit in rooms with rabbis. They come to my house. We have dinner. I go to their house trying to make peace, but they don't understand. <laughs> they said, one night, so help me God, I was in New York with Russell Simmons, and he had Rabbi Shania, who was over many, many Jewish congregations, and he had his wife there, and other white people were there, and they were talking to me about my words. Uh -huh. And the wife said, I can't respect any man that says that Hitler was a great man. I said, miss, I said, this is not my language. I said, you all taught it to me. And if you would be so kind as to go home and pick up your dictionary, great. 
does not mean good except in a colloquial sense. Alexander the Great was great, but he wasn't good. Babylon the Great was great, but he, it wasn't good. A hurricane, when it reaches eight on the Richter scale, is called a great hurricane, but that ain't good. So I said Hitler had to be great because you've been talking about him for over 40 years, but he was not good. Take a drink. <laughs> this is water. This water. <laughs> After all of that clear speech, she came back at the end of that and said, Well, I really don't care what you say. Once you say Hitler was great, I'm through. I said, oh, well, miss, I see what I'm facing here. I'm facing sickness. Yeah, let me tell you, brother. See, don't invite me in no room. If Jesus and God ain't in the room, I ain't bowing to nothing in the room. And you can take that to the bank. Me in the room, I wear them out. Big rich man. I mean, what's that? What's that man? Mike Wallace. He took me to an apartment on, I think it was Fifth Avenue. My God. In a in in a penthouse of Mr. Bronfman. Yeah. Who owns Seagram? Yeah. You know, he's a big, big man. Yeah. And when I was sitting down, I think, were you there, Claudette? I was. My chief of staff and my wife was there and my son. He had some real Mossad-looking dudes around, too. <laughs> <laughs> but the FOI was right there looking at me. Punkin' for nobody. So he, he said to me, Minister, would you like a drink? I said, no, no, sir, Mr. Bronfman, I, I don't drink. He said, you drink orange juice, don't you? I said, yes. He said, well, that's me. He owns Tropicana. He said, do you go to the movies? I said, sometimes. He said, well, that's me. He said, and do you listen to music? I said, yes. He said, well, that's me. So what he's trying to show me is how much power he got. And most Negroes say they would come in a rich man's house buying, buying. said all of that I said Mr. Bronfman I know you're a powerful man I said but when the God gets ready for you all your power can't keep you here one second beyond the time when he calls you in he didn't say no more we went on in to dinner we were having dinner, it was a very lovely dinner. 
he started again. Get him. <laughs> Talking about how powerful you know, they are. And, and they could really hurt me, you know. He didn't say that, but that was the insinuation. I said, you know, Mr. Bronfman, there's a, a verse in the Quran that goes like this. If a flea or anything smaller flew and took a morsel out of your plate, you don't have the power to make that flea come back and drop that morsel back on your plate. So the Quran says, weak is the invoker and weak is the invoked. That ended it. That ended it. See, they only have power when you give them. And you give them power by bowing to that which is less than God. If you resist the devil, he will flee. So look at what Jesus goes on to say. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. I didn't write it. But he said to them, you are of your father. Thessalonians 2 and 9 says, That day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I know you, you are of your father. Well, if you are of your father, you must be the son. Well, your father was a murderer, and you are. Your father was a liar, and you are. Wow. Mm. But who do we follow? Do we follow the son of perdition? Or are we followers of the son of man? You got to decide that today. Who you going to follow? You going to follow somebody that makes evil fair seeming? So you can get drunk and feel good about yourself? Well, Lord, you know, I was having a bad time. And Lord, it was so hard on me. I had to have a little vodka. With some orange juice. <laughs> I was trying to mix good with evil, Lord. The Lord will say, well, why didn't you come to me? Don't you know I am your very help in time of trouble? Why did you go to the bottle and not come to me? Well, God, I don't drink, but I had a reefer. Yeah. I just, I just couldn't face the horror of what was going on in my life. And I went to the reefer man and I got me a hidden boy. I was flying, God, and I knew as high as I was flying, I was about to see you somewhere up there. See how you can make evil look good with your reefer smoking cell? You see that pretty sister join the church? Oh, isn't she fine? Join the mosque. Ooh, look at that girl. See? 
She ain't got no long dress on yet. Oh, look at them fine legs. That, whoo! Before she can get in the line to join. Sister, I'm, I'm a good brother. And I'd like to help make your stay in the mosque or in the church easier. Would you come by my house and have Bible reading with me? See how we can use God's name to justify our madness. Well, family, don't pay attention to the sound bites. Because a good man can be made to look bad with a 30 second sound bite. But they never wanted to share with you the real gospel of Jesus. See? Because that gospel has power to heal, to raise you up from where you are, to give you power over our own weaknesses. That true gospel has that kind of power. I thank my pastor for inviting me to, to come home. And I try to come once a year. And whenever he asks, I cannot refuse. Because we have been brothers for at least 28 years. And I love him as my brother. I love his preaching and I love his singing. And I know, and I know, and I know that Satan is after him. And after us too. So if we're going to be true disciples, which is what I want to be, he said, you're going to be hated of all men for my name's sake. Oh, that's tough, man. If you're not hated by the world for his name's sake, check yourself. You've been co-opted by the world. Some of you, Jesus said, they're going to put in prison. Some of you will be beaten and some of you will be killed. For his name's sake. I know that's right. And I know that they hate me and I know that one day soon they will come after me. I know that they're planning my death. I know that. And I know that there are enemies around me. Everybody that's around me is not my friend. Everybody that was around Jesus was not his friend. But my friend, and you sing the song, what a friend. My friend sees what I don't see. My friend knows the hypocrite that's hiding like a snake. My friend knows the one that's going to deny me in that hour like they denied you in that hour. See, my friend, God I'm talking about, in his Christ, see, they know the heart of their servant. Yes, sir. And now, I've never been more ready than I am now to go where destiny leads me. And I'll tell you straight up, there's a cross waiting for me. Because I dare to speak truth to power. But I love the fact that I'm on my way to my Calvary. But you've got one too. I'm on my way to my Golgotha, but you got one too. And I'm not running from mine, I'm running to the cross. 
Because unless I go, my Father will not be glorified. I want to prove to all of you that the God we serve is real. And that there's no weapon formed against the righteous that will prosper. And look, when they nailed him, when they said, they mocked him and said he's king of the Jews. See? They see Farrakhan as the voice of black people in America and throughout the world. Whether you got a crown for me don't make no difference. God got one. But they know who I am. It really touches me when Jesus in that hour said, Father, forgive them. The disciples ran away. Peter said, I don't know that man. And only John and a few sisters was at the cross with his mother. I'm going to tell you, when you got good women, a good woman will go the last mile with a good man. But these brothers, sometimes they with you in fair weather. But don't let the weather get foul. Because they begin thinking about what they're going to suffer. But in that hour, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And the Jews that were standing nearby said, Behold, he calls for Elijah. Let us see, will Elijah take him down? I know that my Redeemer lives. And because he lives, I too shall live and stand with him at the latter day. And I want us all to stand. Be strong in the Lord. And the victory is ours. Thank you for listening and may God bless you all as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Louis Farrakhan. Come on, Life Center.